Hello and welcome to Step Up Nigeria's podcast. Our podcast is an initiative built to create awareness of governance issues that highlight the cause of corruption and its impact on service delivery. Our podcast is also aimed at promoting values that will help build a society with people of integrity and provide solutions to service delivery challenges faced by everyday night. My name is Fermi Adeola and I am the host of this podcast. You are most welcome to today's episode. On today's podcast, we will be discussing beyond COVID-19, repositioning the Nigerian economy for inclusive growth. And to discuss this topic with me today, I have my program director, Zainab Paruna, as well as a special guest with us today. So please introduce yourself, sir. Um, thank you, Fermi. My name is Antoch Kumachiku. I'm the Chief Executive Officer of Preston Consults and Abuja-based uh, Management Consulting and Research um, Outfit. So we are the publishers of the Public Policy Brief, um, part of which we'll be discussing um, today. Okay. Thank you very much, sir. We're glad to have you. Um, so let me just start off um, with the first question to you. Uh, like you just said, Preston Consults recently released a public policy brief titled COVID-19, the need for bold reforms to deliver sustainable and inclusive growth in Nigeria. Can you give us a quick highlight on some of the key elements in this brief? Okay, so, uh, so thank you. Yes, we published um, this um, particular brief um, a few weeks ago um, on the need for bold reforms to deliver sustainable development and inclusive growth in Nigeria. And the key issues in the brief that we discussed in the brief were the fact that the COVID-19 pandemic threatens to put Nigeria into a, another recession, which will be the second in about four years, um, the last being in 2016. Of course, the um, COVID-19 pandemic um, resulted in oil price um, uh, plunge, uh, as well as um, it disrupted supply chains and led to global um, economic um, downturn in um, most of um, the countries. And the IMF has predicted that this will be the worst recession, that we're headed for another recession, and it will be the worst in about um, three decades. And they predicted, predicted that um, the, the economic growth will fall by between, by around 3.4% um, in 2020. And the, the bad thing there, or the sad thing actually, is that um, this recession, unlike the one of 2016, where we had um, significant external and fiscal buffers, this time around those buffers are not and just not there. And so while the government, so the brief um, spoke about the fact that while the government should um, definitely um, have short-term measures, um, short-term palliative measures, but there is need for significant and bold reforms in the medium to longer term uh, to uh, restart and um, re, re, restart the economy. Mm -hmm. And so um, the brief suggested uh, some policy measures in different areas. One of them was the need to boost agricultural production to ensure food security, um, which we'll discuss um, uh, further as we go along in the podcast. The second was the, on the need to diversify away from oil to um, an export-led um, industrialization. The second um, uh, thing we mentioned in terms of diversification of the economy was the need to strengthen export-oriented um, government agencies like um, the Nigeria Export Import Bank, NEXIM, as well as the free trade zones in order to fast track industrialization. We also spoke about the need to um, deepen the power sector reforms, the need to fast track um, reforms in the solid mineral sector, as well as the need to invest um, in infrastructure development. Because government doesn't have those funds, we advocated um, the, uh, the, that it should be done through public-private um, partnerships. Mm -hmm. We also spoke about um, the need to aggressively uh, pursue crop policies aimed at breaking the poverty trap across the populace. Um, the fourth um, area we advocated policy measures for was the need to unleash the vast potentials that we have with our human resources, basically focusing on education and health sectors. And on education, uh, we advocated that there is need to improve access and quality, both access and quality, 
um, by focusing on technical and uh, vocational education. Um, on health, we uh, suggested that the Basic Health Act should be aggressively implemented um, because it also provides for dedicated funding to the health sector. And then lastly, we also mentioned the need for fiscal responsibility in the management of the um, country's oil resources. Given the fact that oil is the major revenue earner for the country, we felt that there was a need to strengthen those institutions that government has um, established um, to um, help boost or help ensure that the nation's oil resources are well managed. So in a nutshell, those are the basic, um, the basic elements of, um, of the brief. Thank you very much for that, Ron Theresa. Um, so I'm going to go to the very first thing you mentioned, which is one of the reforms um, on boosting production in agriculture. Um, but however, Nigeria's agricultural output has been on a steady decline over the years. So why do you think it's necessary to continue to focus on a sector that has not shown growth despite key government interventions? Okay, um, I was going to begin by um, uh, mentioning, I agree with you completely, that um, our agri sector has um, declined significantly. But to put this in perspective, let's even look at um, where we were in 1965 and where we are today in terms of some of the key uh, variables. So in terms of um, employment, in 1965, agriculture provided 70% of employment in Nigeria. Today, that figure has fallen to just below 50%. Then in terms of composition or contribution to the gross domestic product, um, that is the economy, in 1965, agriculture accounted for 66% of GDP. Today, it accounts for just about 29%. Um, and lastly, in 1965, it accounted for about 62% of foreign exchange Today, we are looking at a figure that is below 5% or thereabouts. And, um, but then we'll come to your, the second aspect of your question, which is why are we still focusing on agriculture despite this um, decline over the years? And um, one thing I want to mention is the fact that since 2016, actually, we witnessed some um, level of um, uh, improvement in the agricultural sector. Um, because the current government has been um, put, uh, putting its mouth, actually, uh, its money where its mouth is in terms of diversification by trying um, to uh, uh, focus policies on, on agricultural sector that would help the sector uh, uh, take back the commanding heights and then be the main focus of the diversification program. The other reason why, um, or the main reason why agriculture remains um, important is because regardless of the fact that output has been falling, it remains the single largest economic sector in Nigeria in terms of contribution to GDP um, at 29%. It also remains the major source of employment in the country, at um, employing about 50% of the workforce. And then in terms of uh, potential growth. The arable land in Nigeria is about 82 million hectares. However, as we speak today, we're only able to cultivate about 34 million hectares. And so there's a lot of potential for growth if the entire 82 million hectares is to be cultivated. Of course, there is no um, gain saying that um, the self-sufficiency in agriculture would directly impact food security. So if we're able to um, produce everything that we, or, or the majority of what we consume, then, and still have others to export, then food security would, um, uh, food security of the country would have improved significantly. And then of course, in terms of policies, which we also advocated in, in the brief, um, some of the what we mentioned is that despite the, the improvements in terms of uh, the border closure and restrictions um, on, um, on the importation of certain uh, agricultural products, that this is not sustainable and that there's need for gradual phasing out of these protectionist policies 
and then the putting in place of these other policies. And one of those we mentioned was the need to improve access to credit for farmers. And then for these, especially smallholder rural farmers who constitute the vast majority of farmers in Nigeria. We also advocated um, the need to establish um, infrastructure facilities. I mentioned the, the road transport, for instance, the rural road transport to move produce from um, farm to market, storage facilities, and um, all of that. The basic aim of this is to improve the supply chain of agricultural um, products. Another policy priority we felt was important was the funding of research on state-of-the-art techniques and technologies for food production. This specifically has implications for the productivity we mentioned in terms of the yield. Um, so with research, um, we should be able to come up with improved varieties and also technologies for improved, um, improved yield and production productivity. And then also we advocated for the strengthening of development finance institutions, especially the Bank of Agriculture and the Development Bank of Nigeria. If the capital business of these organizations increase, they have um, the strength in terms of the, 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 the capital base. We feel that um, they will be in a better position to provide finance um, to farmers, both smallholder and also the bigger ones. And then lastly, we feel that the development of the agriculture um, of agricultural sector should go through the value chain approach. Um, so that from farmers to wholesalers, to even starting from input providers, fertilizers and seedlings, to farmers, to um, wholesalers, to retailers, to processors, all the way to consumers, that there is need to, um, to work on developing every single part of this um, value chain. And this, we feel, uh, should um, help to develop um, and make the agricultural sector really the focus of the government's diversification program. Thank you very much, Sarah. Um, that was quite extensive. I was going to ask um, if she had any thoughts. Um, thanks very much. So for me, when I see a strong focus on agriculture, what it says is we're poor and we're focusing on developing sort of like the, 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 the sector that caters more to poor people because most of the people as you say, that smallholder farmers involved in agriculture, it's we don't see a lot. We don't see compared to like more the smallholder farmers. We don't see a lot of commercial players in the agriculture sector. Um, and so for me, it's more of it's a question of are we are we looking to pivot at some point from this strong focus on agriculture into more the knowledge economy. Um, and, and when I'm speaking, I'm comparing outputs from the agrarian sector in Nigeria to say the creative sector in Nigeria, the Nigerian film and music industry. I'm comparing those two and I'm looking at the amounts of money that have been funded because in comparison, we can see that a lot of the investments that have come into film and music in Nigeria, there's a strong private sector driven um, investment focus. So for me, um, I'm worried um, and I, I'm, I'm looking forward to a future where we start thinking of agriculture as, as, as a finite, as a finite intervention plan. Say in 20 years, we want to transform our agricultural sector so that we don't have so many people working in the agricultural sector. We have a few players who are generating huge um, outputs, huge value that's um, ensuring that we have food stability in Nigeria, we are exporting, um, we are still able to produce um, to generate jobs, but the jobs are quality jobs, right? Because right now the jobs in the agricultural sector are not really quality jobs, right? So we have a lot of people at the the planting, you know, the farm farmland, pure farmland engagement where you have casual labor and all of that, right? But when it comes to the processing, you see that the value chain narrows down. It's like a funnel. At the at the at the process process inside it narrows down and then consumption you know it narrows down further because even what we produce we lose a lot of it from post harvest losses and um, spoilage and all of that because of transportation and then moving into the knowledge economy so how can we use whatever it is that we've learned from the agricultural sector how can we export our knowledge across the the continent across the world how can we look at transforming a sector that has not been doing very well over previous years and making sure that we transform it so that we are not able to tell other people oh this is what we did so that they come to us and learn um, so these are just some of my own concerns around the agricultural sector. 
Okay, so um, before, I, I'm sure you still have some thoughts to respond to Zena, but just so that I move into the next question as well. Um, in your policy, you also mentioned pro-poor policies. Um, and we understand that poor people are routinely excluded and disadvantaged when, you know, these kind of policies don't trickle down um, to their everyday lives. So what forms do you envisage that these policies will take to reach the grassroots? And how can we ensure that they work for poor people? And I think even your comments on the agricultural sector feed into the pro-poor policies because that's a lot of where they get their own revenue from. So what are your thoughts, please? Thank you. Okay, so in terms of pro-poor policies, um, uh, what we're recommending is uh, two broad um, interventions. The first is large-scale pro-poor policies with interventions targeted at poor households. And here we're looking at um, in educational, an example, um, for instance, is educational interventions, which can be targeted at poor people. True, for instance, and here when we talk of targeting it at poor people, we're looking at in the rural areas where the majority of the poor people stay and which also, like you mentioned, where the bulk of agriculture happens. So we're looking at poor rural households where, um, or we should be looking at poor rural households where the uh, majority of poor people stay. So for instance, educational interventions can be targeted at them. And by this we mean, for instance, provision of free tuition, provision of scholarships. For instance, there are certain people who said that it makes more sense to have targeted scholarships than free tuition for everybody, both those that can pay and cannot pay. So the government can decide whether they want to do free tuition, scholarships, free textbooks, free uniforms, you know, the school feeding program, which is ongoing in certain states, free dewarming exercises, and basically also mobilizing, because one of the reasons why people don't want to go to school um, in rural areas is because the quality of teachers they are teaching is very poor. And so the good teachers want to stay in urban areas, in the capital cities, don't want to go to poor rural areas. And then the people you have going there are those that don't have any option. So if we're able to do this, then uh, even though you're not directly putting uh, money in the hands of these poor people, but well, you're providing this children who in a few years, 10, 15 years, will be in the labor force, you are providing them with the abilities to be able to compete favorably in the labor market. You could also do the same thing with the health sector and then other social sectors like nutrition and all of that. The second thing that we propose is to um, establish functional social safety nets to protect the poor from even plunging the pine into poverty. And the government has an array already of uh, social intervention programs, but the key to all of this is targeting. If they are not able to successfully target the poor, then the effectiveness of this program will be very limited because you're spending limited resources on everybody. Meanwhile, if you actually target those scarce resources to the very people who need it, then the um, effectiveness and the results will be much better. We, some of the things we suggested, for instance, uh, um, free subsidized food, for instance, and in some cases free, free food, um, direct cash transfers which to very poor households, which uh, the government is doing, but we are very concerned about the targeting, the effectiveness of the targeting. And in all of this, we think that this should remain in place even after COVID-19. Um, what we want to see is a situation where post-COVID, um, some of these um, interventions are actually um, institutionalized and made more, more permanent, especially if they have successfully um, managed um, to target the poor. So these are some of the, um, the proper policies that uh, we suggested in the brief. And then just very briefly, going back to, um, um, to what um, Zain had mentioned about the need to move away from you know, the underdeveloped agricultural sector and look at more value um, 
uh, value providing sectors like um, the entertainment industry and then the service industry generally. I completely agree with you. And um, we're already moving in that direction. If you see, I mean, for the agricultural sector to move from 66% in 1965 to 29% of, um, of, the, of um, the contribution to GDP, it already shows that some other sectors are taking that, um, that place. However, you see that the movement in terms of employment is not that, has not been able, able to move in that same quantum. And so a lot of our people are still trapped in agriculture. The truth is that the two things are not actually mutually exclusive. For those that have already moved to the more high, high end um, uh, sectors like services, like manufacturing high, high skill blue chip um, uh, manufacturing, we think that that's fine. However, in terms of poverty alleviation and moving people out of poverty, you cannot do that without focusing. So here now we're not talking about just what will grow the GDP because whatever we do, we have to ensure that economic growth is inclusive, the economic growth is sustainable, economic growth is equitable. And so while looking at the overall GDP and economic growth of the country, we should still be looking at and focusing on how do we also, and in some places in like Israel, Agriculture is, with very little space, actually can provide much more than some of these other sectors are providing even in Nigeria. We already have all the things going for us. And so why can't we convert that agricultural sector into what, for instance, the service sectors are doing, the banking sector, the um, entertainment, creative art sector, and all of that. So that's what, just what I was going to say, that they are not mutually exclusive. And um, that, um, yes, we, whether we like it or not, we've already moved in that direction. And that's why you have agriculture uh, increasingly contributing a lower share of, um, of um, GDP. Thank you very much, sir. Um, so then I'll, um, I'll address this question to you first. You know, in the past, with similar reforms like this, we have we have seen that expected outcomes are usually not achieved for several reasons, including corruption, poor design, lack of stakeholder inputs. Um, so what do you think can be done to better achieve this this time around? I think what we should be looking at, one, one key aspect is um, stakeholder inputs. And um, one of my worries is that um, some of the people who are disproportionately affected, um, who will be disproportionately affected, because what we have is we already have people living um, at the bottom of the pyramid, and then we have downward movement of people who lived maybe at close to the middle of the uh, middle of the pyramid, moving downwards because they are people are losing jobs as a result of the pandemic, and then people are falling into, you know, are uh, falling are now poor you know, because they've lost income, they've lost jobs and things like that. And so for me, usually when people sit at the table, it is usually those people at the bottom of the pyramid who don't have strong representatives sitting at the table to enforce that their interests, you know, are, are spoken to um, and that policies speak to their interests as well, um, which is why I'm very glad about the proper policies that um, Dr. Tochuko has mentioned. So for me, in the design, in the design of um, some of these policies and implementation, we want to see um, inclusiveness as well of interest and um, representative interests and um, having everybody sit at the table, every um, relevant person who's going to be affected by all um, this, having representatives from market women to farmers, farmer associations to, um, I don't know, motor park, um, motor park um, administrators, these kinds of people have strong voices because we have a huge this, um, a huge number of people of Nigerians. I mean, Nigeria is still the poverty capital of the world. So we have these people will be speaking to the interests of the most of most Nigerians. So we want to see that. So we don't want to design. Um, I would like to see less. Uh, top-down approaches uh, where we, we design policies and then we implement them without actually taking into um, consideration how it's going to affect people. We see this a lot um, in Nigeria's approach towards transportation, for instance. We think that to have clean cities and effective cities means banning some of the transportation that um, are used mostly by, um, because what we're looking at are not reforms for today. We're looking at reforms that are capable of changing um, our economic um, growth, our progression, um, and our development as a country. And then um, it would be it would be important to have um, to enforce sanctions as well. Um, 
punitive measures that punish people who um, say, for instance, if someone is caught uh, siphoning money, for instance, um, or giving opportunities to families and friends as opposed to on merit base, um, you know, those kinds of things should be punished. There should be provisions for that in, um, in the implementation process. Um, because if you don't, what you're going to see is a certain group of people are benefiting um, and it's going to just be a repeat of what we've seen over and over um, over the years. A certain group of people benefiting while others continue to suffer. And then the impact is, you know, it's lopsided because while you find it the same in the same space, you find some people saying, oh, I've benefited so much. And some people saying I didn't see anything, you know, so unless we have punitive measures um, to enforce sanctions, to enforce punishments, um, we will just continue to see like a repeat of what we've seen before. Thank you very much, Zainab. Um, so Dr. Toch, you could just um, to also respond to the same question in terms of what can be done to achieve better results. But what also are some lessons that Nigeria must take away from this pandemic? So what lessons must we learn, must we take away, and what must be done for things to happen differently? Okay, I'll just continue from where uh, Zainab stopped, um, where she spoke about um, um, policy design. I'll just add one or two things there, uh, because for me, I'll look at it from uh, one very important one is with the respect to policy design. Another is the timing of the policies. And another one is equity considerations in terms of the policies. So to add what she's mentioned already, in terms of policy designs, I want to see a situation where these um, policies, uh, we avoid copy pasting. So where we get things, okay, um, in those countries, in other countries, they did lockdown in this way, so we do lockdown in our case in exactly the same way without looking at the fact that our contexts are different. In the sense that a country like the U.S. can, um, you know, can pour in 1.5 trillion or thereabouts of the in terms of pain, and you can even see in the U.S., for instance, some people have actually found themselves better off with unemployment benefits than what they were earning while they were working. And so now that they're opening up, they're not interested in going back to work. We don't have those kind of policies in Nigeria. So when we also lock down like that, what um, things do we bring? Um, what measures do we bring in to ensure that it doesn't affect our people adversely? So avoid copy pasting. One other thing we should look at is bringing in, and that also ties down to what um, um, Zainab mentioned in terms of bringing in the people who are affected. I also think one of the things we need to do is to bring in local experts. So at the stage where we're designing policies, we shouldn't just, um, you know, um, flying experts from Washington or from London, and they come and just implement here what has been implemented, what they have implemented in Pakistan or India or somewhere. Yes, we're developing countries like them. We have high populations just like them, but we have also very um, different local contexts. And so, you know, the, there's also need also, one more thing I want to mention is the fact that certain policies have greater multiplier effects than others in terms that a particular policy measure can um, affect multiple sectors while some others will only affect one sector. And so in uh, designing policies, we should look at those that have multiplier effect and then that have benefits for other sectors and then start with those ones as low hanging um, fruits. And just like you mentioned also, there's need for accountability, uh, there's need for strategies to monitor progress and maximize impact. But in terms of policy timing, um, it's important because we don't even know. In, uh, with this pandemic, we're still learning. There, there are more unknowns than known. And you notice that we we have been, even the protocols have been changing on the health side, have been changing as we go along. Also for the policy side, um, there are still many unknowns. For instance, we don't know how long the pandemic will last. We don't know if after this first wave, there's going to be a second and a third wave. We also don't know how long the, yes, IMF has um, estimated that uh, the GDP, the growth rate will fall by 3.4% in 2020, and they assume that there will be a recovery by 2021, but we're not even sure of that. We don't know what shape the, the, the um, recovery will take, whether it will be, will have waves of up and downs, or whether it's just going to be normal. So because of that, there's need for um, flexibility in terms of design and implementation of the policies. Very important also is equity considerations in the implementation of policies. Um, we've seen, for instance, that um, a lot of the policies, and that is one of the things that um, this pandemic has done for us, um, has implications um, 
greater implications for the, the poorer people. So you, you lock down, for instance, and then um, people who have savings are able to stock up and you know stay at home. People who live from day to day, from hand to mouth, are not able to stock up because they don't have the resources to stock up, and then they need to go out every day, otherwise they will starve. So we need to put some of these things into consideration. Another issue we need to um, equity con um, consideration is the ramping up of debt. Um, I know that um, in, uh, in, in a lot of countries, including Nigeria, a lot of the measures require borrowing because uh, resources in terms of revenue have been severely um, affected. And so um, uh, the easiest way to go is borrowing. But if we look at it, our debt, our debt profile has already shot up even before the pandemic. And then when revenues are now less, you can only even, even just meet up with what you had planned initially, you need to borrow much more. But we need to consider, you know, um, future generations in all of this, in setting up policy or implementing policy measures to help, uh, 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 to help as palliative or to solve the problems that the pandemic is bringing upon us. We should not borrow in order to stimulate unlimited consumption because that will not be fair on the coming, um, uh, the coming generation. And then quickly uh, to your second part of your question, which is about uh, lessons that we have learned. Uh, three clear lessons that we have learned is one, the pandemic has provided us with an opportunity to revisit our approach to national planning. While there is need for short-term palliative measures and strategies aimed at, uh, you know, temporarily mitigating the effects of the pandemic and of external shocks generally, there is need for long, medium to longer term uh, structural policies that will bring about sustainable growth and inclusive growth. So we shouldn't just focus on short-term measures like um, a fire brigade approach to things, things happen, and then we're always reactive. We should uh, be more proactive and look at longer to um, longer-term measures that will help set our economy in the right path. The second issue is that this um, uh, pandemic, also another lesson, is that it has exposed the fault lines, what I call the fault lines of our economic structure. One, there's over-reliance on oil exports for government revenue and foreign exchange. So whenever anything affects that export of oil, either in terms of the quantum or the prices, we suffer and we suffer grievously. We've refused to learn over and over the years. It has happened so many times. Uh, the hope is that this time around we'll learn from, from this particular one because of the, of the extent of damage that it, um, it has done to our economy already and our livelihoods, and then also because of the length that it could also take before we recover, length of time. Then also, the, it has also shown um, the, that there is, um, we, we have very, very little functional uh, social protection schemes for the poor, regardless of what we have been doing in the past, because if those um, social protection schemes were working, then even with this shock that we're experiencing now with the lockdown, those things should have been sustainable. We'll find a situation where, uh, you know, government is, uh, you know, running health and skelter to ramp up other short-term measures too. So some of these things should be more, uh, you know, um, structured, institutionalized, so that whatever happens, they're able to, all you need to do is to tweak them a little to cater for the poor people. And then also one thing that is clear is insufficiency in food production. We don't have food reserves, we don't have storage facilities. And so when anything, anything happens that prevents it, uh, farmers from being able to go to farm or whatever will suffer because um, we don't have any, 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 any reserves at all. And then also the manufacturing sector is incapable of um, uh, competing in the global economy. This is some of the things that um, we have seen in terms of the uh, economic structure the need for structural transformation of the economy. And the last, the last um, lesson also that we have, um, we have learned is that um, there is, in all of this, is the fact that there is need for a radical change in the way we do our national planning. Um, we need to focus on reforms that will result in transformation. So not just short-term short -term, uh, uh, result, but significant transformation of the economy and, and entire economy. 
And this will make it possible for us, just like um, Zainab was mentioning, if we have um, the different sectors uh, working well, and so a short one sector will not have um, the kind of impact it's currently having on us when we're not able to export oil or sell oil or when the price of oil make it actually um, uh, disincentivize us from even selling where the manufacturing sector is contributing, the service sector is contributing, the agri sector is contributing, the solid mineral sector is contributing, and also the oil sector. Thank you very much, that really salient points. Um, and I agree with you that these are lessons that Nigeria must learn after this pandemic, if not, if any other unforeseen circumstances, God forbid, ever occur, um, it would be like, we, we were just where we were left the first time and we can't have that kind of thing happen again. Um, so thank you very much, Zainab, and thank you very much, Dr. Tachuku. I'm really glad that we were able to have this discussion and thank you so much for um, expounding on what was already so well written. So please, can you um, let tell our listeners where they can follow um, Preston Consult, your work? Um, are you on social media? If you can share that information with us. Uh, thank you. So yes, um, you can follow um, Preston Consult um, on www.prestingconsultsltd.com. So Preston Consults with S, ltd.com. So our policy, public policy briefs, for instance, are there. And then also some of the works we've done in terms of research, in terms of governance, in terms of monitoring and evaluation can also be found there. Okay. Thank you very much, sir. And thank you so much for your time. It was a pleasure to be on the podcast. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.